very much, Rob. Good morning, everyone. I'm Clark Irvin. I'm so pleased to welcome our second speaker, as you heard, Elizabeth Varon. She is a native of Northern Virginia, and she earned her PhD at Yale. And over the years, she has taught not only at the University of Virginia, where she is the Langborn M. Williams Professor of American History, but also at Wellesley College and Temple University. A specialist in the Civil War era and the 19th century South, Professor Varon is the author of several award-winning books, namely, We Mean to Be Counted, White Women and Politics in Antebellum, Virginia, Southern Lady, Yankee Spy, The True Story of Elizabeth Van Lu, A Union Agent in the Heart of the Confederacy, Disunion, The Coming of the American Civil War, and Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. Her latest book is Armies of Deliverance, a New History of the Civil War, and that book won the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize and was favorably reviewed by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and The Nation. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor Liz Barron. Liz, over to you. Thank you so much for the wonderful welcome. I, I wish we were all meeting in person, but I'm, I'm delighted to have a chance to to uh, reach out in this format. So Andrew Johnson, you've heard some about him last week, many of you I, I, I expect. Johnson is among our most enigmatic presidents. Perhaps no other American leader has experienced such a precipitous fall from grace and has seemed so willfully self-destructive. During the Civil War, Johnson was a hero in the North. As the only Southern Senator to reject secession in 1861, he was the preeminent symbol of white Southern unionism. Abraham Lincoln rewarded Johnson's loyalty to the union by appointing him military governor of union occupied Tennessee in 1862 and by putting Johnson on the presidential ticket as Lincoln's running mate in 1864. Johnson for his part relished the spotlight and made the most of it. In fiery speeches, Johnson denounced secession as a hell-born and hell-bound doctrine that must be crushed out and destroyed and totally annihilated, as he put it. Invoking the memory of his fellow Tennessean, Andrew Jackson, Johnson traced his views on secession back to the nullification crisis of 1833, when John Calhoun and his South Carolina militants had threatened disunion and President Andrew Jackson had slapped them down and defended the sanctity of a perpetual union. During his political career, Andrew Johnson frequently invoked Andrew Jackson's stern patriotic heroism and offered himself as the guardian of Jackson's legacy. But the turnabout after the Civil War as Johnson assumed the presidency, that political genealogy came into dispute. In the space of just a few years, Johnson would turn in the eyes of most Northerners from hero to villain, from defender of the Union into a symbol of the resurgent South. In the midst of Johnson's 1868 impeachment trial, the radical Republican Senator Charles Sumner said of the embattled president, quote, Andrew Johnson, is the impersonation of the tyrannical slave power. In him, it lives again. He is the lineal descendant of John C. Calhoun and Jefferson Davis, and he gathers about him the same supporters. It is the old troop of slavery, ready as of old for violence. So how can we explain this turnabout from hero to villain? Well, in modern scholarship, the image persists of Andrew Johnson as politically inept and isolated, a man driven by bigotry and ambition, utterly lacking in Abraham Lincoln's talent for reading or molding public opinion. And such an image helps account for Johnson's political fall, but it fails to capture the broad and toxic scope of Johnson's political influence. So I'll argue this morning that in a sense, it was Johnson's effectiveness at pushing his agenda that makes his presidency so enduringly tragic. In his speeches, in his interviews and vetoes and annual messages, Johnson gave voice to three ideas that shaped the course of Reconstruction and that spelled its doom. The first of these was the idea that wartime emancipation signified nothing but a narrow freedom. It ended slavery, but it did not, in Johnson's view, confer full citizenship rights on the freed people. Secondly, Johnson argued that his own policies, 
which we'll discuss, might have swiftly reunited the North and South after the war had not, the Republicans in Congress squandered a golden moment of reunion by pushing for radical measures like black voting. Finally, Johnson argued that the Congressional Program of Reconstruction, established over his vetoes, inaugurated a period of so-called black rule in which former Confederates were victimized. Now, these three arguments were all reactionary in the sense that they hearken back to the pro-slavery propaganda of the Old South. But Johnson's rhetoric was also preemptive, designed to deem the Republican experiment in black citizenship and interracial democracy a failure before it even really began. Johnson's words and ideas found echo among supporters who sustained him in the belief that he represented the masses of whites in both the North and South. Indeed, Johnson's words were so potent that Republicans made his speech crimes a centerpiece of their impeachment campaign. In short, I'll make the case this morning that Johnson's rhetoric, no less than Lincoln's, constitutes an enduring legacy of the Civil War. So how did Andrew Johnson and the Union lurch from victory to crisis? Johnson took office in April of 1865 amid a welter of conflicting expectations. His life story, his, his humble birth and arduous struggle up the social ladder was well known to Americans. Johnson's unionism was rooted in the class resentments of some non-slaveholding Southern farmers against the elite slaveholding planters. It was rooted in the cultural differences between the mountainous upcountry regions of the South, such as Johnson's own East Tennessee, and the low country plantation districts that were the seedbeds of secession. Johnson's unionism was rooted too in the constitutional argument that the founders intended for the union to be perpetual. Secession was synonymous in Johnson's view with lawlessness. A government without the power to enforce its laws, he declared in 1861, is no government at all. Johnson put this principle into action as military governor of Tennessee. Lincoln placed him in charge there in March of 1862 after battlefield victories had secured the Union control over much of the state. As military governor of Tennessee, Johnson ruled with a heavy hand, as one scholar has put it. He had critics of the Lincoln administration arrested and imprisoned. He imposed punitive taxes on wealthy planters. He seized and closed anti-Union newspapers. Johnson also in this phase of the war charted his own distinct course on the question of wartime emancipation. Although he'd owned a handful of slaves and had supported before the war, the Democratic Party's pro-slavery agenda, uh, Johnson was a Democrat, he gradually came during the war to support emancipation as a military necessity and as a war measure, a means to punish the Confederate elite and rob them of resources. In August of 1863, Johnson freed his own slaves, seeking to set an example for his fellow Tennesseans. And in the year that followed, he delivered a series of speeches in which he called slavery a cancer upon the body politic. And he appealed to Tennesseans to, to pass a, a state constitutional amendment abolishing the institution. Interestingly, Johnson developed in this period, again, during the war, a heroic self-image on this question of emancipation. In the fall of 1864, he told a crowd of African-Americans in Nashville, uh, part of a, of a parade there in his honor, uh, quote, I will indeed be your Moses and lead you through the Red Sea of war and bondage to a fairer future of liberty and peace. Lincoln, for his part, not only abided Johnson's aggressiveness, but rewarded it choosing him as his vice presidential running mate in 1864 to help uh, uh, improve the chances of, of the fusion party, the National Union Party fusing Lincoln's Republicans and pro-war Democrats uh, into a, 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 an electoral force. Lincoln hoped the choice of Johnson would give legitimacy to the wartime reconstruction experiments that were underway in occupied Tennessee and Louisiana and Arkansas states that Lincoln hoped would, uh, he, that he could restore to the Union under loyal leadership. Radical Republicans, for their part, had their doubts about Johnson as Lincoln's running mate. The Congressman Thaddeus Stevens 
remarked archly that Lincoln should have been able to find a running mate without, quote, going down to one of those damn rebel provinces to pick one up. But radicals took some comfort in Johnson's professed hatred of the secessionists. They took satisfaction, of course, in the National Union ticket's resounding victory in the 1864 presidential contest. Lincoln claimed 212 electoral votes to his opponent, McClellan's 21. And Johnson seemingly gave evidence of his tough mindedness when he proclaimed in an April 4th, 1865 speech after the fall of Richmond that, quote, treason must be made odious and traitors must be punished and impoverished. Lee's surrender at Appomattox on April 9, 1865 was, of course, a sweet moment of vindication for Lincoln and for Johnson. But as you all know, the moment was fleeting just five days after the Federal Army's triumph and assassin's bullet took Lincoln's life. In a call and response that played out in public forums across the Union, some Northerners cried out for stern retribution against the South for John Wilkes Booth's heinous deed, while others argued that Lincoln's spirit of magnanimity, of malice towards none, must prevail. But would it prevail? At first, President Johnson seemed to make good on his promise to deal sternly with traitors. He approved the death penalty for four of those convicted of Lincoln's assassination, and he clapped the former Confederate President Jefferson Davis into prison. But Johnson changed course when on May 29, 1865, he formally proclaimed his restoration policy. His amnesty proclamation stipulated that Confederates who took an oath of allegiance to the United States government would have their political and property rights swiftly and fully restored. High ranking Confederate officials and members of the antebellum elite would have to take the added step of going directly to Johnson, the president for pardons. Johnson believed this amnesty proclamation represented a kind of middle ground between the universal forgiveness of the Confederates and universal punishment of them. But as we know, in practice, Johnson very quickly abandoned that middle ground. He, over the course of his presidency, would grant pardons extravagantly to former Confederates, including uh, Confederate higher ups, issuing at least 15,000 pardons to individual rebels while he was president. At the same time he announced this amnesty policy, Johnson also laid out the procedure by which the errant rebel states would be readmitted, restored to the Union. Under the provisional governors for each state that he would appoint, that state had merely to renounce secession and recognize abolition, and it could then hold new elections and send representatives to Washington. Crucially, under Johnson's plan, the electorate in each state would consist of those who had both taken that oath of allegiance to the Union and been eligible to vote before the war in 1860-61. Johnson's plan thus rejected a proposal by radical Republicans that formerly enslaved men should be enfranchised and should join the electorate. Johnson rejects uh, black voting. Johnson's May 1865 proclamations initiated a period of, of self reconstruction, if you will, in the South in which former Confederates uh, uh, rebuilt uh, their states on their own terms. His provisional, provisional governors appointed thousands of former rebels to political office and the new Southern state governments pushed the freed people, former slaves, into a state of subordination as close as possible to slavery. Retooling the old slave codes, the new black codes of body of law, which uh, began taking shape by the end of 1865, the black codes were designed to enforce white supremacy. The codes, for example, pressured blacks to sign annual labor contracts with, with white employers, typically their former masters, made it a crime to act insolent to whites, permitted white judges to seize and apprentice out any black children whose families did not meet white approval, levied regressive taxes on black property, a host of, of punitive measures. And this regime was enforced in these Johnsonian state governments by an all white police system and by white militias and patrollers often composed of Confederate veterans still wearing their gray uniforms. Johnson had called himself, you'll recall, during the war, the Moses of Southern slaves. So where was that Moses now? As the eminent black activist Lewis Hayden of Boston put it, Johnson's policies gave new license to traitors to perpetrate outrages and crimes. Deliver us from such a Moses, Hayden intoned. 
I fear he will prove to be the Pharaoh of our day. Historians have offered a variety of explanations as to why Johnson so quickly abandoned his tough talk against the former Confederates and settled into this policy of appeasement. They've cited as reasons Johnson's own deep-seated racism, his, his pleasure in having the planter class come before him on bended knee to receive their pardons, his commitment to states' rights, and his desire to build a new conservative constituency for a presidential bid in 1868. And these were all factors and there's a connection between them. Johnson believed that the greatest achievement of the Civil War was, as he put it, quote, emancipating the white man, unquote, by which he meant disenthralling non-slaveholding farmers from the dominance of the planter class, and also breaking the back of what Johnson imagined to be an unnatural alliance, an alliance between Southern white elites and their pawns, as he saw it, the enslaved. Johnson believed, in other words, that planter control of black labor had kept the white farmer down before emancipation, and that if African-American men were granted the vote, planters would control those votes and middling white men would, would continue to be marginalized. In other words, Johnson believed in the right of African-Americans to be free from slavery and to work for wages for white employers, but he did not believe the freed people were fit to exercise full citizenship rights. His vision was of a South in which the old planter elite would share power and racial solidarity with their natural allies, as he saw it, the white yeoman class, and in which blacks, though nominally free, would be relegated to a second class peasant status. For such a vision to come to pass, Johnson reckoned, the Southern states must be able to govern their own affairs with minimal interference from the federal government and the Republican Congress. Southern white conservatives hailed Johnson's policies and endorsed this vision. For example, a Tennessee associate of Johnson's wrote the president in June of 1865, invoking their shared commitment to preserving, quote, a white man's government in America, unquote. But Johnson's voluminous correspondence also contains appeals from those who offered an alternate vision of Southern society and of American democracy. Committees of African-American leaders in the South petitioned Johnson for the vote. They invoked their contributions as soldiers to the Union victory in the war. We cannot understand the justice of denying the elective franchise to men who have been fighting for the country, while it is freely given to men who have just returned from four years of fighting against it, stated such a petition from North Carolina. A smattering of white Southern Unionists writing, uh, wrote Johnson with their own appeals for black suffrage, these tended to be grounded in political expediency. If loyal black unionists were not enfranchised, warned a white Tennessee unionist in May of 1865, rebels will re-elect rebels. And that is exactly what came to pass. As I've explained, under Johnson's amnesty plan, scores of former Confederate officials were elected to serve in the US Congress, which would convene in December of 1865. And this set the stage for a showdown. The Republican majority in Congress refused to seat these Confederate representatives and to recognize the Johnsonian state governments. Congress formed a joint committee on reconstruction to assess the impact of Johnson's policies in the South. Now the reports that Congress received from the South, harrowing reports of anti-Black violence and prescription, prompted Republicans to pass a civil rights bill that would invalidate the black codes and secure the freed people the full and equal benefit of laws protecting persons and property. Republican champions of this bill argued that it was a necessary protection as Johnson had emboldened the defeated Confederates with his excessive lenience. Opponents of the civil rights bill countered such arguments by claiming that the measure would destabilize society and lead to race war, race competition and race mixing. In the eyes of conservative Democrats, it was Republican radicalism rather than Johnson's clemency that renewed sectional strife. Johnson echoed such arguments in his March 1866 veto of this civil rights bill. His veto message claimed that the bill didn't simply level the playing field, but instead that it punished and disadvantaged whites, 
quote, the distinction of race and color is by the bill made to operate in favor of the colored against the white race, unquote, in Johnson's words. Johnson raised the specter too in this veto message of social equality warning that the bill might open the way towards legalizing interracial marriage. Johnson's veto of this Civil Rights Act obviated the hope of any cooperation between the president and Congress. The two branches of government were essentially now at war. Republicans declared Johnson to be a traitor to the party and to the union. In April of 1866, Congress overrode the president's veto and also formulated the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, guaranteeing the freed people equal protection of the law and due process. That amendment would uh, pass Congress and then await ratification by the states. Meanwhile, as Johnson and Congress are, are uh, battling each other, tragic events in Memphis, Tennessee dramatized the need for additional protections for black citizenship. On May 1st, 1866, a white mob led by city policemen began a wave of attacks against African-Americans in South Memphis. The violence would stretch out over three terror-filled days. Radical Republicans charged that Johnson and his policies, again, by emboldening ex-Confederates, were responsible for the Memphis riot and for an equally tragic race riot massacre in New Orleans. Johnson fought back against such charges, embarking in August of 1866 on his so-called swing round the circle, an ill-fated tour of Northern cities that he undertook in order to drum up support for this agenda of restoration. This was an open bid, this swing round the circle, to influence the looming 1866 congressional elections to, to promote uh, the election of conservatives and, and, and uh, repudiation of radicals. And this attempt went completely awry. Provoked by hecklers at his various stops, Johnson repeatedly lashed out at the crowds that gathered to hear him, hissing that he was as prepared to fight traitors at the North as he had been prepared to fight Southern traitors during the war. And again, his worldview, uh, uh, strange and, and, and uh, disc, uh, uh, so, so full of discord as it is, his worldview was that radical republicanism was like secessionism, that both were forms of extremism which tended to the destruction of the union. Having cast African-Americans as the pawns of slaveholding planters, he now cast them as the pawns of radical Republicans. Now, what most angered the congressional Republicans who read reports of Johnson's public speeches was that Johnson was going through the country accusing the radicals of inciting black violence in the, the South when it had been clear that white supremacist mobs were the perpetrators. Uh, and Johnson was accusing the radicals too of trying to, as he put it, poison the minds of the American people against him. So here again, insights into Johnson's psychology interwoven with his sputtering accusations against the radical Republicans was a red thread of personal betrayal. Johnson felt himself spurned. Who had run greater risks or made greater sacrifices than himself, Johnson said again and again, alluding to his wartime role as a champion of the Union. He believed that stance should have secured him a deep wellspring of trust and deference from Northerners. In other words, Johnson's behavior was driven by his profound sense of having been cheated out of that which was rightfully his. Now Johnson's intemperate speechifying during the 1866 campaign cost him allies and, and votes. He alienated many moderate Republicans and Democrats alike. And uh, the result was that anti-Johnson Republicans increased their congressional majority. So now Congress was able to enact its own program. The Reconstruction Acts of March, 1867 the congressional program divided the former Confederate states into five military districts placed each under the purview of a commanding general. That military commander would supervise the registration of voters, including African-American men and excluding some unpardoned, uh, unrepentant rebels. They would elect delegates to state conventions that would draft new constitutions and set up new governments. In other words, the congressional program setting a much higher bar of loyalty for restoration uh, of the states to the union. Anticipating Johnson's opposition, Congress also took measures at this moment to constrain him. It passed the Tenure of Office Act, which made it illegal for Johnson to dismiss a cabinet officer without the Senate's approval. And this was clearly a bid to protect men such as Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who supported Congress's program and who clashed with Johnson. <clears throat> 
The congressional program inaugurated an unprecedented experiment in interracial democracy in the former Confederate States. It enfranchised approximately 1 million African-American men and gave them a voice in Southern politics. For the first time, African-Americans held public office in the South at the municipal, county, state, and federal levels. The Republican coalition during uh, Congressional Reconstruction implemented all kinds of measures to modernize the South, improve the quality of life there, providing, for example, public education and social services for black and white citizens alike. And yet for all the change that this program represented, some things did not change. Whites continued to dominate Southern politics, uh, even during Congressional Reconstruction. The numerically dominant element in the Republican coalition was white Southerners, white Southern Republicans, some of whom were former unionists during the war, but some of whom had supported the rebellion. Ex-Confederates largely retained the right to vote during Congressional Reconstruction. Indeed, Black politicians typically argued against the disfranchisement of Confederates in an effort to uphold the sacrosanct principle of universal manhood suffrage, the idea that in a democracy, no man should be denied the vote, even one's political enemies. Even at the height of Congressional Reconstruction, African Americans were underrepresented in Southern politics. They held only roughly 15 to 20% of the elective offices in the South. Now, these are the well-established facts of Reconstruction, but they were facts that Andrew Johnson was unwilling to acknowledge. Indeed, he sought to preempt radical Reconstruction by associating it with vengeance, corruption, subjugation, disunion. His veto of the first Reconstruction Act labeled the congressional program an exercise in absolute despotism aimed at Africanizing the Southern part of our territory, as he put it. Johnson's veto of the second Reconstruction Act claimed that if his own policy of reconciliation had been supported by Congress, then peace and its blessings would have prevailed. Instead, because of radical intransigence, Johnson fumed, millions of whites would be deprived of rights guaranteed by the Constitution examples of Johnson's rhetoric. Now, as he dug in his heels, the House Judiciary Committee began to explore the possibility of his impeachment. And a June 1867 investigation found that there was not yet explicit evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. But then Johnson turned more aggressive. In August, he began to remove from office men who were zealously carrying out the congressional program. Uh, in the, such as uh, uh, Union General F Philip Sheridan. In the fall of 1867, the House J Judiciary Committee recommended impeachment on the grounds of usurpation of power, but the, uh, public opinion wasn't yet ready for this measure, it was voted down. Johnson continued to be aggressively defiant. In his third annual message to Congress, delivered in December of 1867, he hammered away at familiar themes. He again insisted that restoration in the first moments of peace would have been easy and certain if Congress had only followed his lead. He again staked the claim that the enfranchisement of African-Americans portended their domination of the South. In other words, in Johnson's view, there was no possibility of interracial democracy, only of a zero sum game, the supremacy of one race over another. And he said uh, uh, the following, along these lines, quote, if the inferior obtains the ascendancy, it will govern with reference only to its own interests and create such a tyranny as this continent has never yet witnessed. Again, a zero sum game theory of, of race relations in which any gains for blacks would come at the expense of whites. Now in weaving this myth of black rule, Johnson was indeed repurposing old arguments, antebellum defenders of slavery, if we to cast our eyes back a bit in order to foster uh, solidarity in their own ranks had dramatically exaggerated the power of Northern abolitionists. Now here was Johnson exaggerating the political power of Southern blacks. And these tactics were in both cases, knowing and cynical. Johnson was marshalling fear and prejudice in order to thwart the congressional effort to remake the South. In short, Johnson's words mattered. And that is why Republicans assailed Johnson for abusing the power of the bully pulpit. The formal provocation for impeachment came in February of 1868, when Johnson, having failed to get Senate approval for the dismissal of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, ordered him removed nonetheless. Johnson had now, Republicans believed, clearly 
uh, violated the Tenure of Office Act. On February 24th, 1868, the House voted to impeach the president. 11 articles of impeachment specified the charges laid at Johnson's table. For our purposes today, the most revealing of these impeachment articles was Article 10. This article condemned Johnson for his words, his speech making, for the quote, intemperate, inflammatory, and scandalous harangues, and therein utter loud threats and bitter menaces that Johnson had offered on his swing round the circle. In these speeches, Article 10 charged, Johnson did, quote, attempt to bring into disgrace, ridicule, hatred, contempt, and reproach the Congress of the United States. According to Ben Butler, the most fervent of the House impeachment managers, the debates in the Senate uh, essentially pitted the principle of decency of speech against the principle of freedom of speech. In his opening argument before the Senate, Butler charged Johnson not only with slandering Congress, but with bringing the office of the president into disgrace and disrepute. Johnson's speeches in, in Cleveland and St. Louis and elsewhere during the 1866 swing round the circle in which Johnson had exchanged jibes and barbs with the crowd had befit a common brawler or a common scold, not a president, Butler charged. Johnson had lacked that gravity of deportment required of his office. Butler held up as a particularly revolting exhibition, Johnson's se September 1866 speech in Cleveland, in which Johnson had responded to charges that he was a traitor, a Judas to the cause of union by trying to flip the script. At, uh, this was Johnson at his mo most unhinged. He had cried out to this audience, quote, if I have played the Judas, who has been my Christ? Was it Thaddeus Stevens? Was it Wendell Phillips? Was it Charles Sumner? They are the men that stop and compare themselves with the savior and everybody that differs with them in opinion and tries to stay and arrest their diabolical and nefarious policy is to be denounced as a Judas. Well, let me say to you, Johnson went on, if you will stand by me, I will kick them out. I will kick them out just as fast as I can. Now in Butler's view and, and the view of the house impeachment managers, these denunciations were not merely buffoonery, they were blasphemy. Johnson's words, his comportment made a mockery of the union's victory in the civil war. They relinquished the moral high ground that the union had won at such great cost. Johnson through his lawyers, countered these charges by asserting as the impeachment trials unfolding his right to exercise freedom of speech. And to the considerable dismay of Johnson's counsel who wanted him to keep quiet, Johnson exercised that right to free speech by giving a series of defiant newspaper interviews with the press, even as the impeachment trial was unfolding. In one such interview, J Johnson defended both the content and style of his speeches. Um, he said, is telling the truth to the people in a public address a high misdemeanor? If I have advised the people in terms not exactly befitting a state document, it has been the more pointed, it has been because the more pointedly the truth is told, the quicker the masses of people apprehend it. So here Johnson was in effect trumpeting his populist credentials, his ear for the vernacular. He was not giving an inch, in other words. In the end, of course, Johnson escaped impeachment by the narrowest of of margins, the Senate tally of 35, four and 19 against was just one vote shy of the necessary two thirds majority. Republicans nonetheless argued that the trial thoroughly discredited Johnson. And this has been uh, the view of modern historians by and large who have described Johnson after the uh, impeachment and the Senate trial as, as essentially a cipher without any influence on public policy. But to fully assess Johnson's legacy, we have to confront and grapple with the fact that he felt utterly vindicated by the Senate vote. In March of 1869, Johnson delivered a farewell address to the nation as he left office, in which he trumpeted his own blamelessness. No responsibility for blood that has been shed rests upon me, Johnson declared. He ended the farewell address with a stark expression of defiance. I have nothing to regret. Johnson's tenure was coming to an end, but his ideas persisted. His very arguments against congressional reconstruction were featured in the Democratic Party's presidential campaign of 1868, which cast the Democrat Horatio Seymour as the champion of white men and the Republican U.S. Grant as the symbol of black rule. Seymour lost to Grant, but captured 47% of the popular vote. Johnson's words would live on in the propaganda of the so-called redeemers, 
ex-Confederates who fomented vigilante violence to bring down congressional reconstruction. These included men like John Brown Gordon, former Confederate general turned Klansman, who accused the radical Republicans of having squandered the golden moment of reunion, echoing Johnson's own words. Johnson's words would live on too in the cult of the lost cause, which demonized congressional reconstruction and celebrated the White House victory over it. Johnson himself would nearly ride the tide of redemption back into power. He won his Senate seat back in January of 1875, only to suffer a stroke uh, later that July that took his, his life. In conclusion, Johnson's term is a cautionary tale about the limits of impeachment uh, and what it can achieve, but it's also a striking example of the power of presidents to set the terms of political debates and of the power of their words to do lasting harm. Thank you. I look forward to hearing questions. Liz, that was absolutely terrific. Thank you so much. Oh, As you were talking, I'm sure like, like everyone else, I couldn't help but think about the parallels to today and you ended there. Could you elaborate on that just a little bit? Yes, I think there are, there are absolutely uh, uh, parallels to today. There are, there are uh, many similarities between former President Trump and, and Andrew Johnson in terms of their, their, their political, uh, political styles. There is a, a longstanding playbook of fear mongering in American politics, a kind of divide uh, and conquer uh, uh, view of things that includes that, that zero sum game view of, of race relations. So whether a modern politician you know, literally knows about the example of Johnson or not, um, those th that that playbook has been used again and again and again uh, 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 over the years, um, and and there is a a very long history in our country of anti-democratic white supremacist mob violence. You know, the, the obviously and understandably, our first impulse. Uh, uh, it, it, at a moment like January 6th is to say, oh, that's not us. Unfortunately, there is a long history of, of again, of anti-democratic uh, violence that we can trace uh, back a long way to mob attacks on abolitionists, to mob uh, attempts to recapture fugitive slaves, to the period of reconstruction itself. Uh, and I gave the examples of the New Orleans and Memphis riots, again, some of what was so chilling uh, the massacres really rather than riots. What was so chilling about them is that law enforcement was among the white supremacist mob. So, so the black victims of those mobs had no real protection from law enforcement. Um, and, and those attacks included once congressional reconstruction began, those attacks included attacks on elected officials and, and essentially coup attempts at the city and state level. And we see this in New Orleans at Colfax, uh, in Louisiana, at Colfax, Louisiana, and in New Orleans itself, in which essentially white supremacist mobs tried to overturn elected uh, uh, you know, interracial Republican uh, governments at, at, at Bayonet Point uh, and at the end of a cannon. And of course, we see this kind of mob violence persist after Reconstruction in Wilmington, North Carolina, at, at uh, uh, Tulsa, and so on. And so often uh, in these cases, we can see very clearly in the weeks and months leading up to them, again, a very cynical, very explicit campaign to, to whip up hatreds uh, and uh, through, through all kinds of falsehoods. Um, so, uh, you know, yes, there are, there are, there are uh, uh, some, some very, very, um, uh, clear, clear uh, patterns that that we have yet to break out of. In his northern tour, otherwise, were there explicit or all but explicit calls to actually engage in violence? What you quoted are, you know, stirring up hatreds, as you say. But yeah, I think that the key thing is that um, the 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 association of Johnson with the violence had to do with his reaction to Memphis and New Orleans in the sense that he sided with the with the perpetrators of the violence, not with the victims of the violence. And and you know again, um, I, I'm a 19th century historian, and my my generally my 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 standing assumption has been the 19th century is, you know, let's, let's be very aware of the differences between then and now, as well as the continuities, 
uh, the differences of, of, of language and of assumptions, the political spectrum from its one end to another looked different than it does now, uh, and so on. But but there are um, you know there there are nonetheless some 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 uh, some strong continuities, and we can see you know sometimes for a historian they 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 appear in ways that are so striking the 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 language i use that verb emboldened a couple times in this talk to describe what how republicans believe that johnson had brought all this strife uh, you know, had conjured all this strife. He had emboldened the ex-Confederates to think they could have their way. Well, we, we've seen a lot of that, that sort of language in connection with January 6th, the idea that, that whatever you think about Trump's speech in the moment, his rhetoric had for months and years emboldened, uh, emboldened the, 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 the rioters. So, so the, you know, again, interesting, interesting parallels uh, to, to contemplate. One of the questions from our one of our parishioners is about the arc of Johnson's career and the fact that he's actually rather accomplished, politically yeah. speaking, a mayor, state representative, state senator, governor, United States senator, vice president, president, and then senator again. Is that unprecedented in American history? I mean, I think that the, 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 that's, um, he, he, he did have a political gift. He, he did very much mold himself in, in, in Jackson's image and, and Jackson is a good sort of precedent for Johnson, someone who genuinely uh, of humble roots, who, who uh, literally moved up the, up the ladder through um, you know, a host of, uh, of political offices, Lincoln himself, of course, also, uh, of uh, of humble roots, so there's there's no. I mean, it's an important point to make. Again, it's so tempting. You know, you compare J Johnson and Lincoln, and there is Lincoln. You know, arguably our greatest president, and so, so skilled politically, and so skilled particularly rhetorically, able to explain to the American people what this war was about, what its stakes were why to fight it. And it's just easy to sort of see Johnson as, as um, the antithesis of Lincoln in, 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 again, lacking these political skills. But as your questioner has noted, Johnson would not have risen up the way he did if he had lacked in political skills. And you know, one of the things that's so interesting to me is that th obviously there was no Facebook and Twitter and whatnot, but, but another sort of similarity is that Johnson had an echo chamber. If you look at Johnson's correspondence, it's full of letters from constituents who, who cheer him on. And those were the voices he heard. He managed to fill, create a bubble around himself. He managed to use the newspaper sympathetic to him to get his, his views and ideas out there. So even in a time of primitive technology, it was very possible for one side to, to, to screen out uh, you know, uh, anything that it, that it didn't want to hear. And Johnson definitely was in an, an echo chamber in which the only things he was hearing uh, were letters like the one from that constituent that said, uh, the, the white people of the country support you uh, in your bid to ensure white supremacy. Last question. Um, speaking of the contrast, as you just did, between Lincoln and um, Johnson, both in temperament and rhetorical skills, of course, just before the second inaugural, there was Johnson's speech where he was drunk. Could you talk a little bit about that? And I mean, that you know, the, Link, it, it's just a fascinating, fascinating question. Again, why, why Lincoln chose Johnson, why he didn't see Johnson for what he was. Uh, you know, Johnson had tried to beg off going to the inaugural and Lincoln said, no, you, you know, you get yourself to Washington and so on, and, you know, to have, a, a, again, a show of strength in this national union movement. Again, Johnson was chosen for what he symbolized, a Democrat and a Southerner who'd signed on to Lincoln's war, uh, uh, including, including emancipation. But he didn't see uh, you know, he, 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 he didn't see and recognize and know about Johnson's liabilities, a, a, a tendency towards uh, alcoholic rowdyism, as one Republican paper would later put it, was, was, uh, was, was definitely one of them. Uh, so Johnson absolutely stumbles out of the gate at that inauguration, and it should have been a, a you know, sign to Lincoln uh, about, uh, you know, Johnson's um, um, sort of trouble with self-control and emotional self-control and rhetorical self-control. But, um, you know, again, part of the, 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 the 
key is to understand how important it was to Lincoln uh, that that um, that once the spell of secessionism was broken, he changed Southern hearts and minds and bring bring Southerners back on board to the Union. And Johnson seemed like the perfect symbol of that possibility. But again, a deeply flawed man behind the veneer of that of that symbol. Indeed. So, well, what a tour de force. We can't thank you enough, Liz. And you oh, have graciously pleasure. offered if anyone had a question that you didn't get answered, yeah, then she has offered to make her um, email address, which we'll make available to all of you so that you can ask questions directly. Liz, thank you ever so much. We're in your debt and all best wishes. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thanks everyone for tuning in. It's very much appreciated. Please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you.